We're in the book of Psalms, and we're going to explore Psalm 11 through 18 this evening. Psalms, of course, just by way of a little bit of review and warm-up, was Israel's hymnal. And uh, Psalms are poetry laced with strong theology intended to be sung or accompanied with uh, musical instruments. The Hebrew term to heal them is praises. And 55 of these are specifically addressed to the chief musician. And uh, the Greek term was psalmoi, uh, poems to be sung to a stringed instrument, or psalter, which is a harp or stringed instrument. So these, it's from those terms that we get our English term for psalms. And they have the nature of poetry. Now, when you and I think of poetry, we think of phonetic design. Our poems in the, in the West typically have parallelism of sound, what we call a rhyme, or parallelism of tempo or time, the, the rhythm. And so, uh, but that's phonetic in both cases. Hebrew pr- poetry is not really uh, focused on the phonetic design, but the conceptual design. And it indulges in the parallelism of ideas, a comparative uh, parallelism to illuminate things, contrastive uh, 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 parallelism for antithesis, and uh, completive or synthetic ones. And we'll also find terms like Selah throughout here, which is uh, disputed by some scholars. It's certainly a pause. Some people think it's just for the mu- musical side of it. But uh, many very learned scholars that I respect highly uh, emphasize that it's probably a pause to connect ideas. So we're dealing with concepts here. And uh, truth, not tunes, in other words. And uh, synonymous parallelism is when the second line restates the first. Uh, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Two expressions that are parallel. One simply restates the, the second one. Then there's antithetic parallelism, which is the opposite. The lines are in contrast to one another. Here's an example. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. See, the two ideas are contrastive. It's like two sides of a coin, in a sense. They're opposites, and yet they're uh, parallel in another sense. Then there's synthetic parallelism, and that's where each successive line expands or amplifies the first. And uh, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And you've probably sung that in some songs, but in any case, it's, I'm sure, very familiar, but it's an example of what they call synthetic parallelism. And, of course, the Psalms have many sources, 73 specifically ascribed to David and a group of others, the oldest one probably being the one written by Moses himself, 48 are anonymous for a total of 150. Many people catalog these Psalms into five books, sometimes called the Genesis book, the Exodus book, Leviticus Numbers in Deuteronomy, and uh, under the idea that they are somehow parallel to that. I mention this because you'll find it frequently referred to in many commentaries. I have to tell you candidly, I don't see much in that. I think it's a, it, it, it impresses me as being a little contrived. Having said all that learned stuff, I'm going to now encourage you to forget it. One of the things that uh, we want to do with the book of Psalms is Shift gears a little bit. Oh, as we go, we'll try to highlight things that may be of a scholastic interest, but the real issue, the real issue, the real caveat I want to give you is for our souls. In the Scripture, we have clean animals and unclean animals. The difference among them being the clean animals chew the cud. And there are many rabbis and other commentators that feel that that's also suggestive of what we're supposed to be doing in, with the word of God. And uh, thy words were found and I did eat them, Jeremiah tells us. And we find John saying a similar thing in Revelation 10 and so on. See, the, chewing the cud was the key to clean sacrifices and we are to be his sacrifice. So one of the things you want to do with Psalms is not just study them for their expositional content, but to just really meditate um, you probably really won't understand the psalm until you've read it, uh, read it maybe 25 times. And I'm not exaggerating much here. You want to avoid, in this particular portion of our studies, what I'll call analysis paralysis. Over-analyzing ana- these things can blindfold our souls to the real message. And uh, so we want to really savor the psalms. 
I want you to focus on prayerful absorption rather than intellectual dissection. And um, we really want to taste the Psalms and uh, meditate on them. Because the Psalms are a gateway to his presence. That's what makes them so precious. Whether you're in a situation where you need comfort, encouragement, whether you're paralyzed by fear because of circumstances, whatever, the more extreme the circumstances you're experiencing, both good or bad, the more precious these Psalms will be for you. Last uh, session we had Psalms 9 and 10, which really focused on what some people might call Satan's man. The people that are characterized by pride, boasting, and self-sufficiency. That's where we closed last time. We're going to open this study with Psalm 11, which is going to deal with the testing of the righteous. Psalm 12 is going to deal with the, God, with the godly in the midst of godlessness. And the ultimate godlessness will be hinted at from, that, of the great tribulation. And Psalm 13 we'll encounter, will speak of the plight of God's people in the great tribulation. So some of these psalms, even though they were precipitated by actual events in David's life, also seem to be inspired by the Holy Spirit to give some guidance, some perceptions regarding times of trouble that are just, it's very specific times of trouble that are yet ahead of us. And then we're going to get into Psalm 14, which will deal with the depravity of man in the last days again, with his atheistic attitude and his rebellious ways. Have you never noticed that lately? It's been that way all through history, but getting worse, obviously. And Psalm 15 is going to deal with those who shall enter the kingdom. And uh, it, ha it will have some surprises for those that um, are perhaps overly enamored with uh, messianic practices and uh, Christians that have put, Gentiles that have put themselves under the 613 commandments and all that. If you're into that, you, you, I'm going to solicit your patience and forgiveness for the way we're going to look at Psalm 15. So there'll be some surprises there. Psalm 16 is sometimes called the Song of the Resurrection. There's passages in there that are quoted uh, many, many times in the New Testament in, in regards to Jesus' resurrection. Psalm 17, a precious prayer by David. And Psalm 18, and a joyous, extensive prayer when he was finally delivered from Saul and his enemies and so forth. And we're going to leave for next time, but I'm mentioning it now so you can be thinking about it, Psalm 19. We are going to really take a careful look at this unusual psalm about the creation. That will open our session next time. So, okay, Psalm 11. David's crisis. You know, David was often in danger. Uh, many of these have to do with Absalom's rebellion. Uh, many of them have to do with his uh, exile from Saul, who was trying to kill him. David was spent uh, 10 years in exile, fleeing. Uh, 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 enemies of various kinds. In the court of Saul, as described in 1 Samuel 19, in the wilderness being chased uh, by Saul then, and then during the rebellion of Absalom. These were trying times, not just, they were, not just because of his son, which of course is grievous, but also because he successfully got a large number of people behind him. And David actually had to flee um, his post and it flees the city of Jerusalem, you know, that called the city of David. He was in serious trouble. He made some wise moves. He hid in the wilderness. He didn't confront. He actually abandoned Jerusalem and took refuge over the Jordan. And uh, all of this got honors because he, he, he did not deal in violence. And he had several times an opportunity to kill Saul, and he did not. And all of this will go, will go to his credit. But here in this psalm, unlike some of the ones we've looked at, which clearly dealt with those issues, he did not flee his post, and he remained on duty, trusting in the Lord. A little different approach, a little different situation. And uh, so, let's just jump in. Psalm 11, it's labeled to the chief musician, a psalm of David, in the Lord I put my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? First of all, we notice in the Hebrew that the word flee is in the plural. So this advice by some to get to flee wasn't just for David, it was his whole court and his friends. 
That was the, that's what's implied here. It's not obvious in the translation, but that's sort of the, the, the thing. And he, his advisors told him to flee like a bird, so to speak, and he refused. See, they, his friends, lacked the faith that God would see him through. So David didn't take their advice. And uh, he, so he says, in the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain. So you get a little different tone where you know that background. Second verse, for lo, and that means the word lo isn't just a poetic phrase. It means look by sight, in other words. For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. In other words, the threats he's facing, even though he has the courage to stand his ground, are not imaginary or exaggerated. They're real. That's what he's saying. Look, the wicked bend their bow. They make the ready their arrow upon the string and the, that they may privily shoot at the upright. And then he goes on, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? See, we, you want to make sure that your foundations are sound. If they are, you stick your ground. That's really, in effect, the flavor of what's going on here. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The word try here means like testing. His eyes try or test the children of men. And it's, a, it's, a Hebrew, it's a verb in the Hebrew that implies uh, testing metals by fire, in effect. And uh, so... If you're in Christ, your trials work for you, not against us. In 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7 and following, we'll go into that. Okay, so we have uh, verse 5. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Whose soul? Whose soul, Who soul hateth? Strange phrase, isn't it? That should be capital H in the minds of many, right? The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. And the word try, of course, is bachan, which means to examine or prove, try. Testing metals is by fire. Verse 6, upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness, his countenance doth behold the upright. This whole idea of his countenance, seeing his face, it, we, you find that expression in number six, you know, may his countenance uh, shine upon you and so forth. What does that mean? To see his face implies access. It implies access, the way we might say it, to see his face. And the way that really should be translated is the upright shall behold his face. His countenance doth behold the upright. In the English, it's a little awkward. What we're really saying, the upright shall behold his face. We will have access to the face of God. And that's... Now, David has some interesting imagery for judgment. Fire and brimstone he mentioned here. And, of course, that suggests to us Genesis 19. Remember fire and brimstone? Sodom and Gomorrah and all of that? Whenever I think of Sodom and Gomorrah, I'm reminded of Billy Graham's Classic crack. He made that several decades ago. If God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. I always think of that. And of course, you find fire and brimstone in Isaiah 30 and Revelation 9 and so on. And then David used the term scorching wind, okay? And that also will echo in Psalm 18, which we'll get to tonight. And of course, he speaks of the poisonous cup. The cup is that portion that you taste of or that you're given, and so forth, or whatever. And uh, we hear of God's wrath being poured out like bowls and so forth. Poisonous cup. And it's all through the Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all use that same idiom. And Revelation in the three different places uses that. That, that cliche is, I'm sure, familiar to you. Okay, so let's, we got through that one quickly. Tonight we'll have several because many of them are not that long. Psalm 12. To the chief musician upon the Shimoneth. A Psalm of David. Now, you may recall we ran into this term last time. Shimoneth actually means like the eighth and could mean an octave. That's a speculation because their, their music was not necessarily organized the way we're used to in the West. But, but to the chief musician upon it, Shimoneth, and that may be a, an eight 
string something, or it may be an eighth uh, moving it up octave or down an octave for the singers. Those are all speculations by scholars. The, 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 it's not clear. Verse 1 of, chapter, of uh, Psalm 12. Help, Lord, for the godly man seetheth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. This is a, you know, a, a, a cry of the faithful that uh, due to the apparent lack or dearth of faithful leaders. Lord, the godly man seetheth for the, fra- the faithful fail from among the children of men. We look around, we can't find any believers, can't find people who are faithful. That's exactly what Elijah felt. Till God says, hey, I got 7,000 you don't know about. Stop your pouting, you know. And uh, Isaiah had the same reaction, Isaiah 57. And Micah has the same reaction in Micah 7. There are times when the faithful of God get discouraged because it would seem to them that they're alone. You may feel that way too. And especially these days too, it's astonishing to see some of the most prominent, respected scholars get messed up on their, in their position on the Bible. Uh, men who know better getting involved with preterism on the one hand in the eschatological area or in the emergent church as it's going. It's, it's astonishing that people seem to want to go back to the you know, 14th, 15th centuries with incense and icons. If you want to go back, why don't they go back to the book of Acts? Okay? But there are times that we, it seems that the, that the faithful fail from among the children of men. It seems like they're not around. And then the psalmist goes on, they speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. Double speak from double hearts. We know what double speak is, right? Anyone ever listen to any of the news broadcasts, these politicians? Boy, with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. Boy, boy, boy. The whole term political correctness uh, uh, is, a, is a euphemism for that kind of foolishness. We live in a culture that denies the existence of truth. And you and I are committed to truth. We worship truth. He walked among us. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips. Oh, boy. And the tongue that speaketh proud things. See, flattery is manipulation. Let's realize that. Yes, it's insincere, but it's usually insincerity with an agenda. Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Who have said, with our tongue will we prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Well, you're going to find out, gang. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. So again, we'll see these threats, these clouds, But God is always our refuge, always the one that will have the last word. And I love this verse, verse 6 of chapter 12. The words of the Lord are pure words. A silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. His words are flawless, they're pure. And uh, there are a lot of implications of verse 6. If his words are pure, then you want to give a wide berth to paraphrases. It's very popular to deal in modern, what some modern translations are really paraphrases, but many of them are unabashedly paraphrases. They would paraphrase God? You've got to be kidding. See, there's two kinds of theories of translation. There's um, verbal equivalency and dynamic equivalency. Dynamic equivalency tries to render the original text into today's language. The the goals are noble, but they're giving deference to today's language. Verbal equivalency is translations that try to capture what was really said. And one of the things you'll discover as you mature in studying your Bible is that you will outgrow these modern translations. You'll outgrow the paraphrases. 
because you'll discover more and more that you need to get a respect for the precision of what God has said. And uh, many, many times what sounds like just a figure of speech carries with it an insight that gets lost if the translator uh, is, isn't faithful to the original text. And uh, now we live in a world where those issues are getting less and less critical because you can go right to the Greek or Hebrew without knowing Greek or Hebrew today. Because this, this uh, computer software is such that if you put your little cursor on a word, it will pop up and tell you what the Greek or Hebrew said, what it means, parts of speech. It'll diagram the sentence for you if you want. So you don't have to know the language, the original language, to be able to exploit the original language. And these software packages are free. Some of them, shareware and so forth, eSword and some of these, good, great. The Blue Letter Bible is on the internet. It's free. That's all that for you. There are also some packages that cost a few hundred dollars that are more elaborate, quicker in response, and you're not dependent, you, you can operate without being on the net, which is, if you're on a plane like I am, you need anyway. So, anyway, so um, the words of the Lord are pure words. We want to have a respect for what God said, not what some translator thinks he really meant. Anyway, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. By the way, Psalm 138 verse 2 says, before I bring that out, does God, is God serious about his name? Does he venerate the name of God? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God. You know, how many have known, noticed that he's, he, he venerates his name? Can I see a show of hands? About 20% of you. Come on. All right. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Do you realize there's something that he puts even above his name? That's a shock. It was shocked to me when I first saw this. Psalm 138, verse 2. He exalts his word even above his name, the Scripture tells us. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. It's referring to situations where the things that God abhors are exalted in places like our entertainments. Almost every imaginable evil is exalted. Not, not just violence, sexual aberrations, you name it, is merchandise, is primary export of the United States. Okay, let's go to uh, Psalm 13. Here's again to the chief musician, a psalm of David. And this is all about David's feelings, his enemies, and his faith. He was, you know, David was an incredible guy, an incredible warrior, very skilled military tactician, but also a songwriter, a poet, probably the principal poet of his country. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? He's expressing candidly his feelings. Has God hid his face from him? Not really, but he feels that way. How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? 1 Samuel 20, verse 3 says, There is one, he says, David says, There is one step between me and death. For 10 years, he's running and never more than a step away from death. Whether he, He's had a tough time. And there are times that he felt very abandoned, very lonely. How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? See, one of the points that's going to seep through this is that feelings are deceptive. You may feel one thing, that's when you need to make a faith choice. The secret to a Christian walk is to make your choices by faith, not feelings, under the confidence that God will subsequently align your feelings with that choice. You don't make the choice because you feel that way. You make the choice by faith, and your feelings will align. That's one of the great discoveries you need to make personally. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitfully wicked. The actual word is incurably wicked. 
So you don't trust your heart in making those kinds of decisions. You make them by faith. And uh, how long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemy say, I have prevailed against him. And those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. See, people often underestimate God. You think that he can't fulfill his promises. You want to be knowledgeable in the promises of God, point one, and point two, you need to trust him. I don't know of a day that goes by where God doesn't find some new way to ask the question, do you trust me? Is he asking you that in your personal life? Are there things going on that cause you to doubt his promises? Are you ignorant of them? Do you know them and do you know that he's serious about them? That those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. Now the word moved is moat, which re means it moved in a very specific sense to totter, shake, waver, slip. Shaked up. When I am, those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved, when I waver and so forth. But David goes on to say, but I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. The word salvation here is, is uh, what name do you think? What is, that, what is the Hebrew word there for salvation? Anyone know? Yeshua. Exactly. That's what the word means. We use the term salvation in a very specific theological sense. He's using it in a much broader sense, but in either case, it's the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, interestingly enough. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. See, God's people live on promises, not explanations. You may not understand why. You may not understand where it's headed. Do you care? You shouldn't. You rely on his promises. All you want to be sure is that God's promises apply. And, uh, but I have trusted in thy mercy. The but is a translation from fear to faith. You had all those dire earlier verses, and he says, but I have trusted in thy mercy. That's the transition from fear to faith, from questioning to claiming. I don't know what's going on, but I claim God's promises. That's what he's basically saying. Boy, that's powerful if we would just use it in our lives. Okay, let's go to Psalm 14. We're doing all right here. Psalm 14, I might call the practical atheist. You want to be an atheist? Here's a lot of practical background you want to have if you're going to be an atheist, by the way. And you realize, and by, uh, by the way, Psalm 14 is duplica almost duplicated in Psalm 53. There's just a two small changes different. The practical atheist... We've already talked about the practical atheist in Psalm 10 because it highlights their pr the proud attitude. Atheism is based on pride. I love what uh, John Ankerberg does when he encounters an, encounters an atheist. You say you're an atheist? Prove it. Just by what do you mean? Well, you say that you're militantly declaring there is no God. That must mean you know everything because whatever it is you don't know, he could be hiding behind that. So to make a declaration like that, you're in effect saying you know everything. It's a way of revealing what the real root is pride, not intellect. Psalm 12 took about, talked about their deceitful words. We've talked about their proud attitude, the deceitful words. We've already covered that ground. Psalm 14 is going to focus not just on atheism in a broad sense, but the corrupt deeds that derive from that. And if they deny truth, they're going to deny good as well as evil and their deeds will become corrupt. And as I say, Psalm 14 is duplicated in Psalm 53. Okay, here we go. Psalm 14 to the chief mu uh, musician, a Psalm of David. And the first verse is one I'm sure you've heard. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Did you know that April 1st is Atheist Day? Did you know that? Right. You know, there are some places you can dial a number for the prayer of the day. Did you know that? Did you know that in New York there's a number that you can dial for the uh, atheist can dial for, for the thought of the day? Nobody answers. Okay, that's silly, all right. <laughs> okay, yeah, right. moving right along, yeah. 
The fool that said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. And by the way, the, oh, one other thing. The word fool in the English comes from a Latin word that means bellows. Because they're full of hot air. See? No, really. I mean, that, that's the connection. The word fool is an old English term for bellows. Like you'd try to heat, you know, start, start a fire. And... Uh, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. As I say, bellows suggesting full of hot air. There are three words in the Hebrew that mean fool. Gasil, which is a dull, stupid fellow, simpleton, an arrogant one. Uh, evil, which is uh, foolish, one that despises wisdom, one of who mocks when guilty, one who is quarrelsome, licentious, and so forth. And it's this third one that's the word that's used here, Nabal. You may remember that name from 1 Samuel 25. He was the name of Abigail's husband who wouldn't help David to his own detriment. This is the one that, see, the fool here is lacking moral sense. He's not necessarily dumb. This isn't a fool in the sense of being dull or lo low intellect. The fool can be very brilliant. He may have a tremendous intellect. He's not, he's not lacking normal intelligence. He has a lack of moral sense in his heart, not a mental problem in the head. Remember, the fool has said what? In his head there is no God? No. The fool has said in his heart. The root issue is not his brilliance, his PhDs or whatever. The problem is his accountability. It's, it's a flight from accountability. Psalm 14, verse 3, they are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And Paul quotes this in Romans 3, verses 9 to 26. Everyone, all of us, are of a fallen race. 2 Peter 3 speaks of this ignorance as being willful. To be an atheist is not being stupid in the intellectual sense. It's being willful, willfully ignorant. And it's astonishing to see scientists participate in the rejection of intelligent design. I, I just find this flabbergasting. People who are technically oriented may remember that in 1955, the Rand Corporation made a milestone by publishing a book called A Million Random Digits. To the average layman, that sounds pretty stupid. It's a book of just numbers that are random numbers. No. There are occasions when in the laboratory and certain experiments you need a source of random numbers that are really random, not pseudo-random numbers. And they're hard to come by, actually, if you know what we're talking about. And so the Rand Corporation published a book of a million random numbers, and what that means is they tested them on computers to make sure there were no patterns, no predictable repetitions. They went, they went to elaborate means to make sure they were as random as they could be made random. The point is that randomness is defined as the absence of design. The absence of design. Now, who would have thought that within 50 years, the scientific community would try to ascribe the most elegant designs we've ever encountered to the operation of randomness? That is, by definition, absurd. That is, that is a contradiction in terms. And that, yet, that's what our culture is. That's the direction we've moved. We deny that... Uh, the uh, abs uh, formation of absolute truth. Two plus two is four. We can't escape that. It always has been, always will be. Two plus three is five, last time I looked, right? But uh, there, is, there is a thing called absolute truth. Anyway, we live in a culture that denies that. In any case, God's verdict is there is none that doeth good, no, not one. And Paul quotes this, as I say, in Romans 3. And uh, God is the general and the refuge of the righteous. He's in charge, and he's going to have his way, believe me. He continues here in verse 4. Have all workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and call not upon the Lord? There were they in great fear, for God is in the generation of the righteous. He's the general. He's the boss. He's the guy in charge. Ye have shamed the counsel of the poor, because the Lord is his refuge. See, in other words, when you deny these truths, you are insulting God. You know, it's really interesting to me, you study the ancient pagan cultures and they made idols of wood and stone and metal, whatever, 
and ascribed the creation to these false gods, which is pretty stupid, but that's what they did. Or to insects or an animal. You know, they have all these crazy things. We've invented the most insulting idol of all. We don't ascribe the creation of the world to Baal or somebody. We say it wasn't, it wasn't created, no one was necessary. It was randomness. We actually worship nothingness. Boy, it's a, it's a boundary condition. It's, You have shamed the counsel of the poor because the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion. When the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice and Israel shall be glad. By the captivity, it doesn't mean like being captive. It means re restore the fortunes of. It's a, a strange translation in that sense, I suspect. That the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion. Do you realize that nine out of ten churches in America deny that that the salvation of Israel will come out of Zion? Because the church has replaced Israel? No, no, uh-uh. When we pray the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come, we're praying for the fulfillment of these prophecies. And there, Paul hammers away at this in three chapters of the book of Romans, 9, 10, and 11. And if you want to put in your notes Romans 25, uh, Romans, excuse me, 11, verse 25 to 31. Let's take a look at it. Paul says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That's a term for the church. There's a number God is looking for. When that number is complete, he's going to say to the Son, go get him. Then Paul continues, And so all Israel shall be saved. It is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer. It's quoting the very verse, very psalm we were into, right? So out of... Uh, so out of Zion, Chuck, you're a Christian Zionist. Absolutely. I'm proud of it. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them. Who's speaking here? Paul, but he's quoting who? God. When I shall take away their sins. That day is coming. And as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved of the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. And he goes on. Chapters 9, 10, 11, hammering away for three chapters that God is not finished with Israel, despite what most pulpits in this country preach. Do your own homework. Come to your own conclusions. Israel and the church are not to be confused. Different origins, different destinies. Okay, now we come to the one, if you haven't been bothered so far, I know there's going to be some that will be upset with Psalm 15. I was quite surprised that I really got into it, what it was really saying. Book of Psalms, Psalm 15. The Psalm of David. And... Uh, See, Psalm 14 identified two groups, just to put you in context here. Two groups. The workers of iniquity, that was chapter, uh, Psalm 10 and 12, and the generation of the righteous, the believing remnant. Okay? Now, understand that Psalm 15 is not a prescription for being saved. It's a description how saved people ought to behave if they would please God in fellowship with Him. You understand the distinction? Many people don't. But let's be sensitive right up front. Okay, the psalm opens up. David says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? That's the question the psalm is going to deal with. Now, the word dwell is a fascinating word. You'll want to be sensitive to this one. In the, in the Hebrew, it's shakan, which means to settle down, abide, dwell, tabernacle, or reside. Why am I making a point of that? Because it's a derivative of that that is shakana. Shekinah, which means God's glory dwelling. And it's referred to in Exodus several times, 1 Chronicles 22, and in three different Psalms we'll encounter it as we go. Dwell. Come, say Shekinah doesn't appear, appear in, the, in, the, in the Bible. Yes, it does in the sense of being derived from Shekinah, to dwell. God tabernacle, His glory tabernacled with Him. That's what the tabernacle was for. That's what the Holy of Holies was for, that He tabernacled, He dwelt between the chariot and in there. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the obedience of the righteous. You know, the rabbis, many of you probably realize, the rabbis take the Torah 
and they've identified 613 commandments. And if you're Jewish, you're well acquainted with these 613 commandments. If you are a Gentile, you know that Jesus Christ fulfilled the law on our behalf. And many Gentile believers get fascinated and benefited by learning about what they call, some people call a messianic uh, 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 service or ministry. Because I think as Christians, we need to know more than we usually do about the Old Testament. Because Paul said, whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. He also goes on to say they were a foreshadowing things to come, their prophetic implications. Okay, that's all good news. There's a danger, though. Many Gentiles getting enamored with Messianic fellowships tend to get drawn under Judaism and try to keep the 613 commandments. And there's a tension there. Most Christians are in one of two extremes. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know anything about this. Or they go to the other extreme where they try to become Jewish. They don't understand what they're, they're denying Christ by doing that. They don't realize it. Book of Galatians is still there. Check it out. Psalm 15 does something I didn't anticipate. It reduces the 613 commandments to 11. And that's going that, to, that, I think that's interesting. Six of them are detailed. There's 11 of them that'll be in Psalm 15, but six of them are really echoes of Isaiah 33, verse 15 and 16. You might want to write that down. Let's take a look at it. Isaiah 33, 15, 16, which instructs us as, He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from the hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. There are six of them right there. He shall dwell on high. He's answering the question that David posed. Who shall dwell in the tabernacle? These are six conditions of the guy that's dwelling in the tabernacle. He walks up righteously. He speaketh uprightly. He despises the gain of oppressions. He shaketh his hands from holding of bribes. He stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood and shutteth his eyes from the seeing evil. He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of the rocks. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be pure. That's Isaiah's contribution. Let's take three from Micah 6, 8. Key verse, one you want to memorize. Micah 6, 8. Micah says, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? Boy, that's direct, understandable. That gives us some focus, doesn't it? To do justly? Fair enough. We can figure that out. To love mercy? and to walk humbly before thy God. Okay. And there's one more. And this is perhaps the most important of all. Habakkuk 2.4. And it's going to be echoed in three epistles I'll come to. Habakkuk 2.4. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. A little verse in Habakkuk 2.4. You would... Read this and never notice it again, except of what happened through history, that it became the discovery of a guy by the name of Martin Luther, who was really troubled with his own sinful nature, and a lot of it, he was a very troubled person. And a monk called that to his attention. And in climbing over the Israel, he walked to, to Rome for his big thing, and when he got in Rome, he was shocked by what he really found there. And then he went to try to correct the, what he, the, the, the issues in the church. You know the story of the Reformation. But many people don't realize his main mantle, if I can put, use that term, or mantra if you want to use that term, the just shall live by faith. Who are the just? There is a book of the Bible, the definitive statement of Christian doctrine that we call the book of Romans, that basically addresses itself to identifying justification. Who are the just? And it quotes this verse right up front. In Romans chapter 1, verse 7, you'll find this verse quoted as the cornerstone of Paul's argument about who the just are. Then he writes a book called the Galatians, to the Galatians, which describes how they shall live. How shall the just live? 
And Galatians lays that out and quotes this verse as its cornerstone in chapter 3, verse 11. The just shall live by faith. What do you mean by faith? Well, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28, just before penning this chapter that everybody calls the hall of faith. Hebrews answer that, answers that for you. And what's fascinating to me is that these three epistles, once you study them carefully, you'll discover they are a trilogy of commentary on this one verse. The just shall live by faith. Who are the just? Romans 1. Romans. How shall they live? Galatians. By faith? Give me examples. Chapter 11, so on. Now, the reason I find this so fascinating is that uh, that's one of the reasons I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. Some scholars debate that. If those scholars are correct, it's even a bigger miracle to have this elegant design of this trilogy. It's a, it's a fingerprint of the Holy Spirit in any case. Okay. So we've got 11 commandments. And uh, so let's just, that, 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 this is the obedience of the righteous. Let's jump in. Let's now, that, with that background, let's see what, what uh, David tells us here. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? David gives us three, three steps. He that walketh uprightly, who worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. Now, when you meditate on this, you'll discover there are three aspects that he's to. He that walketh uprightly, that worketh righteousness, and speak of the truth. These three things are the practical aspects of life. Three basic areas. Blameless character, righteous conduct, and truthful conversation. Okay? And verse 2 lists these three basic areas in life. If you got them covered, you got it made. Now, he's going to go ahead in the next verses 3, 4, and 5 to apply these three things practically and specifically in his, in his, in his uh, psalm. Let's take a look at chapters 3, 4, and 5. I mean, verses 3, 4, and 5. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. That's one of them. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth, out, putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. Okay, so we have these three things. Blameless character, righteous conduct, truthful conversation. Applied practically, the first, we, uh, uh, we'll pick uh, integrity. The blameless character is a way of what we might call integrity. Righteous conduct, I'll call that honesty. And truthful conversation, I'll call that sincerity. Okay, and verses 3, 4, and 5, not in that order, but that's where the, it deals with those three things. Integrity, blameless character. See, what we are determines what we do and what we say. The reason our, sometimes our speech or conduct is so damning is because it reveals our character. Someone said character is what you're doing when you don't think no one's looking. And you can go all through the Scripture. You can get these in your notes, Isaiah 33, 58, Jeremiah 7. Ezekiel 18, they all deal with this. Pretty straightforward stuff. Matthew 5, Christ's manifesto we call the Sermon on the Mount, deals with all of this. And notice we say blameless, not sinless. It simply speaks to the soundness of character, integrity, complete loyalty to God. Blameless means that your sins are forgiven. You're not sinless, but your sins are forgiven. There's a difference. Noah was blameless, Genesis 6, 9. Abraham was blameless, Genesis 17. Were they sinless? No, of course not. But they were blameless. Well, the second area is honesty, what David calls righteous conduct. You know, David has a list of sins that were in good standing. And, I might, and, and I'm being a little flippant here. They're the popular sins, the ones that everybody was doing, you know. It's okay, everyone's doing it, you know. And that's in verse 5. He talks about the exorbitant interest was prohibited. And he gets in all through the, uh, the Torah. The Jew was not to charge interest to another Jew. But the tone of it, of course, is exorbitant interest. Also accepting bribes. When there's money in the courtroom, you will not have, jur you will not have justice. And that, that's all through the, there. Some people define politics, the conduct of public affairs for private advantage. Have you noticed? 
the lack of a rule of law in our country, as we began to realize that was the reality, that also means it's the end of the country. There is no rule of law operative in America any longer, tragically, for a lot of reasons. And then we have the third one, truthful conversation, we're calling sincerity. Truth is the glue that holds our society together. Whether you're at the top of society with its phoniness, or whether you're at the dregs of society with its gangs and street thing, the absence of truth is what makes both ends intolerable. Truth is the glue that holds society together. So that raises a question, what is the most painful of all sins? What sins have accounted for more pain and suffering than any other? It isn't murder. It isn't even adultery, I don't believe. It's gossip. Quietly, its venom does its silent work, undermining confidences, Betraying relationships, spreading unseen injustices, invisibly promoting misunderstandings and distrust. I suspect if we could measure it, it would be shocked to realize how much pain and suffering is caused by what we loosely might call gossip. It's a form of betrayal. Can't escape that. It's a form of betrayal. It's a direct violation of one of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, verse 16. Thou shalt not give false witness. And gossip can be damaging even if it's true. It doesn't have to be promoted. And we could go all through Leviticus 19, 16, where it's prohibited there. Proverbs 11, 18, 26, 20, 26. On it goes. Anyway, our poet laureate David says, He that doeth these things, the ones he's listed. He didn't list 613. He listed 11, in effect. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. And again, that's new, that to totter, shake, slip, be moved, to be overthrown. He will never be overthrown. He will never be greatly shaken is what it's really saying. If you do those things, God is your protector, your refuge, and your strength, your rock. Let's see what Jesus said about these kinds of things. Mark 12. One of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Good question. Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. That is known as the Shema. De Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. You'll find it on every doorpost in a Jewish home or an office building, whatever. The little thing that's on the, the mezuzah, which is on the doorpost, typically at an angle. And, with the, the, and what's usually, not necessarily, but usually in it is Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. It's called the Shema. That's what Jesus is quoting here as the great commandment. But he's not through. He says, the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And he's simply quoting Leviticus 19.18. The scribe said unto him, well, master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Really? Are they important? Of course. But this is, this is the core of the thing. These are more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices together. And Jesus saw that he answered discreetly. He said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst to ask him any questions. I love those clothes. Okay, let's move on. We've got Psalm 16. You can make this, I think. This is a michtam. What is a michtam? No one's quite sure. <laughs> Mictums always seem to, there's about six of them, um, and from 56 to 60 are mictums. They apparently are all happy and triumphant uh, in their style. Uh, some scholars think the term really means a golden jewel or a special treasure. These are speculations. 
Um, we know some are victims and they're always upbeat kinds of things. It's a very personal hymn of joy in any case. And it, it uh, matches, uh, this, this, this particular one matches David's response to the covenant. In 2 Samuel 7, when the Davidic covenant is announced to David, he is joyed and he, he responds with words that are very, very parallel to this psalm. So we think it's the same subject. We do know it's messianic. Because it points to Christ, yes, but many, com many psalms that point to Christ, we don't call messianic typically unless they're quoted as such in the New Testament. Because I could argue, and probably defend the argument, that every psalm speaks of Jesus Christ in some way or another. But the ones we call messianic are the ones typically they're quoted by. This one's quoted by Peter at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. It's also quoted by Paul at Antioch of Pisidia in Acts 13, this particular psalm is. Okay, a victim of David. There's, all, there's a couple other quotes coming too, but I'll leave that there in a minute. David says, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord. My goodness extendeth not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names unto my lips. He's talking about maintaining a separation from an inhospitable world. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen to me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a, a goodly heritage. Praise God. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. There's that... That, not being moved again. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh shall also rest in hope. And next comes a incredible thing. See, by the way, he speaks about night seasons. It's, the word nights there is in plural. He went to night school. The nights are plural. And uh, by the way, the other underlying thing, you know, is the future is your friend if you're in the Lord. That's also the tone in here. But this is it's called the Song of the Resurrection. We see the life of Christ in verse 8. We have the death of Christ in verse 9. We have the resurrection of Christ in verse 10. We have the ascension of Christ in verse 11. Pretty exciting. This is a, this is a neat psalm. Psalm 16, verse 10. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Remember Lazarus? He was... Seeing corruption, he was in the grave four days. Christ was in only three days. He would not see corruption. This is quoted by Peter in, in, at Pentecost in Acts 2. It's quoted by Paul in Acts 3. And uh, we have the resurrection. This, deal, this, this deals with the resurrection of the body. Christ's body was an interesting body, the resurrected body. It was real and substantial. This was not a spirit. Remember Luke 24, 39, Jesus confronted them in the upper room you know, when he, uh, that, that night. Handle me and see. A spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see me have. Remember? Okay. So he's real. He's tangible. He's got a body that's tangible. Don't get confused by what comes here now. He ingested food. In fact, he never appears after his resurrection without eating. My kind of guy. Okay. Yet he had a property that disturbs many. He could appear and disappear at will. So he's tangible. He's not a spirit, fuzzy, you know, uh, holographic or something. No, he is tangible. And yet he could go through locked doors. He could pass through locked doors and so forth. Interesting. The last, uh, next verse, thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So let's talk about his resurrection body again. Real and substantial, ingested food, can appear and disappear, pass through locked doors. Here's the point. We know from Philippians 3.20 and from 1 John 3.2, we will be like him. Whatever he enjoys, we will too. John emphasized, 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, it's not, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. We're not going to be 
someone looking at a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object like we do with a photograph. We're not talking about a three-dimensional representation of a four-dimensional object. We will be like him, for we shall see him as whatever dimensionality he presently enjoys, that's at least 11 according to the mathematicians, we will enjoy the same. Beloved, we doth not yet appear what we shall be. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him because we shall, we shall see him as he is. Paul's insight into advanced physics is astonishing. Okay, it's Psalm 17, a prayer of David. This is one of five that are identified as prayers. Similar terms used in Habakkuk 3 and Psalm 72, verse 20. But... Uh, of a dozen words for prayer, the word here is tapilla, which can mean to intervene. So it may be an intervening type of prayer. He's going to deal with three pressing concerns and three major requests. And each one will open with an address to the Lord. Hear the right, O Lord. Attend unto my cry. Give ear unto my prayer that goeth not out with feigned lips. Let my sentence come forth from thy presence. Let thine eyes behold the things that are equal. He's going to have three things. He's going to ask for a vindication, examine me, first five verses. He'll seek protection, keep me, he'll ask, verses 6 through 12. And then he'll deal with salvation, rescue me. Examine me, keep me, rescue me are the three main threads in this psalm. Thou hast proved mine heart, thou hast visited me in the night, thou hast tried me and shall find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. He's got a good conscience. He's been diligent before the Lord. He challenges the Lord to test, you know, to, 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 to test him. Concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. Hold up my goings in thy paths, that my footsteps slip not. I have called upon thee, for thou wilt Hear me. See, he's going now. He's going to the protection phase of this thing. Keep me, in other words. Even though he's a master military tactician, he knows that without God's help, he cannot escape. I've called upon thee, thou wilt hear me, O God, incline thine ear unto me, and hear my speech. Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O Thou that savest by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. This sounds very similar to the song of Moses in Exodus 15, by the way. Keep me as the apple of the eye, hide me under the shadow of thy wings. The apple of the eye is a strange term. You may not know what it really means. It really means the, pup the pupil. It's the dark part of your eye. And the, when you look at the apple of the eye, you usually, in somebody's eye, you see yourself. Think about that, Okay. The Hebrew actually means the little man of the eye, but it's really talking about the ineffective people. Now hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Now here's a term again that uh, David's using. You think of the shadow of your wings, you think of a mother hen and her chicks, or it might, he might be alluding to the cherubim, their wings in the Holy of Holies. In any case, from the wicked that oppress me, from my deadly enemies who compass me about, they are enclosed in their own fat. With their mouth they speak proudly. Now he's not talking about being overweight here in, in the traditional sense. He's talking about fat in the hearts. They're calloused by disobedience. They're insensitive to others. The grease or the fat of the heart is an idiom used all through the prophets. With their mouth they speak proudly. He's also, uh, the, the, the term fat also, by the way, fatness is also an idiom used by the prophets for a selfish or worldly lifestyle. Those are terms that might not be comfortable unless you've done a lot of reading in those areas, but that's clearly the intent of the Hebrew. They have now compassed us in our steps. They have set their eyes bowing down to the earth like as a lion that is greedy of his prey and as a as it were, a young lion lurking in secret places. You need to realize David was under a threat. You know, twice Saul, the king, threw a spear and missed. Four times Saul sent soldiers to capture him. He's been in exile for, this is not a, you know, a few weeks, a few months. This is 10 years of this stuff. We get to verse 13, we now are starting his third request where he says, rescue me. Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down, deliver my soul from the wicked. 
which is thy sword. From men which are thy hand. Now this, this verse 14 is a little difficult, difficult translation. Let's go slowly. From men which are thy hand, O Lord, from men of the world, which have their portion in this life, and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure, they are full of children, and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. What he's really saying is David's enemies will be satisfied only in this life, leaving their wealth even to their kids. It's, it's, it sounds, uh, it's not obvious what he's really driving at here. In verse 15, as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. This is his comment on his afterlife. You have to search very carefully for insights on the views of afterlife in the Old Testament, but they're there. And that's what he's really talking about. He's going to, he knows he's got a glorious future when he gets resurrected, which is kind of exciting. Okay, I think we can squeeze one more in here. Let's take Psalm 18 and call it an evening. To the chief musician, the Psalm of David, the servant of the Lord who spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, and then it goes on. So this is a triumphant, um, joyous celebration in this psalm of David. Finally, after all this, he's now freed. It's done. And so he just gives God all the credit. He says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. And um, by the way, there's another version of this in, in, in 2 Psalm 22. And uh, there's also allusions to this in Psalm 116. We'll c count those later. The psalm both opens the first three verses and the last four verses, five verses, um, with doxologies. Now, he says, I will love thee. The word there in the Hebrew is racham, which means to love deeply, to have mercy, to be compassionate, to have tender affection. It's the term that's related to the womb. The connotation is here a love that a mother has of a baby or a father of a son or the Lord with respect to Israel. It's a, it's a very special kind of love. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Boy, it says it all. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows of death have compassed me. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me, hindered me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens. The highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He shot out his lightnings and discomfited them. Then the channels of the waters were seen and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. Whew. I won't even try to add anything to that. It doesn't even need comment. He sent from above and he took me and he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and, he, and from them that hated me, for they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Back in verse 6, by the way, the word there was, meant a tight, the word distress meant a tight place in a corner. So here, what he, he talks, in, in other words, hemmed in. Here, because he, it says he... Uh, uh, he brought me forth into a large place. He relieved that crowding. See, he's, he's, it's, it's, it's antithetical to that earlier term is the point. Okay. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanly, uh, cleanness of my hands, hath he recomp recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also upright before him. 
I kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyesight. With a merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. And with an upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the froward, thou wilt show thyself froward. For thou wilt save the afflicted people, but wilt bring down high looks. For thou wilt light my candle. The Lord, my God, will enlighten my darkness. For by thee I have run through a troop, and by my God have I leaped over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those who, that trust in him. For who is God save the Lord? Who is a rock save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hind's feet and setteth me upon the high places. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation. Thy right hand hath holden me up and thy gentleness hath made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me that my feet did not slip. See, God all this time was preparing him for service. He takes a lot of time to train his own. He trained Joseph in Egypt for 13 years before he was called into service. Moses, 40 years on the backside of the desert. And Joshua, too, 40 years in training. God takes time to train his people properly. I pursued mine enemies, David continues, and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again until they were consumed. I have wounded them that were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. For thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued under me those that rose up against me. Thou hast given me the necks of mine enemies that I might destroy them that hate me. They cried, but there was none to save them, even unto the Lord, but he answered them not. Then did I beat them small as the dust before the wind. I did cast them out as the dirt in the streets. Thou hast delivered me from the strivings of the people. Thou hast made me the head of the heathen. A people whom I have not known shall serve me. As soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. The strangers shall submit themselves unto me. The strangers shall fade away and be afraid out of their close places. The Lord liveth and blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God that avengeth me and subdueth the people under me. He delivereth me from mine enemies. Yea, thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O God, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises unto thy name. In great deliverance giveth he to his king, and showeth mercy to his anointed, to David, and to his seed forevermore. Verse 49, the first of those two verses, uh, Paul quotes it in Romans 15, verse 9, and he applies it to Jews praising God to the Gentiles. And then the verse, uh, a couple of verses later, he announces that Jesus Christ is reigning over both the Jews and the Gentiles, just as Isaiah 11, verse 10 predicts and so forth. And... Uh, Verse 50, it says, Great deliverance giveth he to his king, and showeth mercy is anointed to David. This is David calling himself by his name. Do you know who else does that? Little children. They're, hey, can you give Tommy a cookie? You know, it, it, it's, it's an endearment kind of relationship. See, children often use their own names when make, requesting something. Well, that's what David's doing here. Just, you know, like, like, a, like a child. Great deliverance giveth he to his king, and showeth mercy to his anointed, to David, and to his seed forevermore. Okay, we've, looked, we've, gone, we've got 9 and 10 previous sins. We've been through 11, 12, and uh, 13, plight of God's people in great tribulation, and so on. 14, the depravity of man, last days. 15, was those who shall enter the kingdom with some surprises, a focus, focus on the essentials and not the ceremonial laws. Uh, Psalm 16, the song of the resurrection, a great messianic passage. Then we have the prayer of David and this special prayer of deliverance that we've just gone through. Now, next time, we are going to be treated to Psalm 19. Psalm 19 will be a special time. We will go more than just that, but I want you for next time to be especially attentive 
to Psalm 19. You might read all the way through to 24, and don't just read them. Spend this week meditating on them. But be prepared for a real tour de force with Psalm 19. It's a very special one. Be prepared similarly for 20 and 21. And I can tell you right now, you're not ready for 22. That is awesome. It reads as if it was dictated by Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross. And that leads then to the shepherd's psalms, 23, 24, and 25. But uh, pick, you know, pick up the next five for next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.